Would you pray with me? Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise this morning for this infinite mercy. And I pray that you would anoint my mind and my lips and anoint all of our minds and hearts to hear and receive this good news that we might be strengthened and empowered as we go forth seeking to live on your mission. So Lord, we ask for your help in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you please be seated? I wonder if you've ever had someone in your life, maybe someone you've had deep conflict with, uh, and maybe a person that you might, maybe you wouldn't use this word, but sort of deep down, your enemy, someone that, that they don't like you and you don't like them, but then they, then they suddenly start to change their ways. They start to seek to make amends, maybe. Maybe they even become a believer. And yet, even though this is happening, even though this change is happening in their life and things are going in a positive direction, you're still carrying around anger and resentment. And there's a little part of you somewhere deep down that thinks, God, how could you forgive that person after what they did, after what they've been, after what they've been like? Lord, how can you possibly forgive that person? And and now that you've forgiven them, you expect me to forgive them. Are you serious, God? Maybe, I don't know if you've ever felt that way. I definitely have felt that way at times, carrying around that anger, that resentment. And I think this passage, particularly this story from Jonah, it really connects with that experience that we have in this life, right? And I think here's the big idea, that God is so merciful that he might even forgive our enemies. And what happens when God forgives our enemies is two things. One, It's only at that point that we really start to understand our own idolatry and our own sin. And it's only at that point that we really start to understand the abundance of God's grace. It's only when you see God forgive someone that you thought could never be forgiven, could never be restored, that you start to really reflect and understand how deeply broken and sinful you are and how immense that we stood beneath a debt we could never afford. How immense and abundant God's grace is. So let me, let me talk through this passage with you and show you why I think that's really the big idea. Um, first, it might be useful to have a quick refresher on this book of Jonah. So I don't know if you, this is part of the lectionary readings in ordinary time for this year, but I don't know if you guys were preaching through this. But book of Jonah, very, very short book about this prophet named Jonah. He lived uh, in the, the middle of the 8th century. So he's, he's about a generation before this mighty army from Assyria comes down to Israel and destroys the northern capital, Samaria, and carries people off into exile. So that hasn't quite happened yet, but but the Assyrians are kind of the looming threat sort of geopolitically, right? They are the big threat to Israel. Even though things are going well in Israel, Jeroboam II has expanded the the former borders of the kingdom of Israel. Um, Jonah and the people of Israel and Jeroboam, they would have They would have been a little bit uncertain and a little bit shaking in their boots about these Assyrians. By this time, the Assyrians had already become the world superpower of that day. And and everybody uh, knew the Assyrians' reputation for um, just being violent, rapacious, warlike, and unstoppable, right? So this, it's into this situation that God shows up one day in Jonah's life and says, go to Nineveh the capital, the great city of Assyria, go to Nineveh and warn them that my judgment is coming on them. That happens in the very, very beginning. Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. God calls Jonah to go out to Nineveh. And you know the famous story, right? Jonah immediately goes the opposite way, right? It says that he fled from the presence of the Lord, going to Tarshish or going across, you could also translate that, uh, going across the open sea going as far away from God and as far away from Assyria as he could possibly get. And of course, God brings that storm uh, into the midst and the sailors that are on the ship that Jonah's taking to get as far away from God as he can. Um, Jonah realizes this storm is from God. Uh, God's not mad at you sailors. He's not mad at this ship. He's mad about my rebellion, my disobedience. So throw me overboard and you'll be delivered. Throw me into the sea. And God, 
the, the, probably the most famous thing in the story, right? God appoints a great fish to come and swallow Jonah, to rescue Jonah from death and uh, judgment. And then in the beginning of, uh, the end of chapter 2, that fish vomits Jonah out on the land. Uh, I think we're to understand the fish brought him back to where he should have gone in the first place. And then Jonah then finally says, okay, fine, I'll go to Nineveh. But all he says in Nineveh, you remember all he says in Nineveh, uh, you know, right, basically is judgment's coming. If you don't get it together, God's going to destroy you. So that's where we're at in chapter 3. And when the people, uh, it says, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be destroyed. When the people of Nineveh hear this word of judgment, it says that they, they begin to dress in sackcloth, sackcloth and ashes to repent from their ways, to turn from their evil ways, verse 10 says, from the, from the average person on the street all the way up to the king. They immediately, 180, and, and turn to repentance. They relent or they change their mind about this evil thing, whatever the, whatever the particular thing God was going to judge them for. They turn from their evil way, and God relents from bringing this disaster in chapter 3, verse 10. Okay, so that's kind of where we're at. Think, keep all that in your mind, because when we get to chapter 4 of Jonah, Jonah's presented sort of ironically, almost satirically, because he's such a fool in some sense, because of all that he's just experienced in the first, chapter, first three chapters. It, it really almost defies belief that he could be so dense and so hard-hearted. And yet, when we look at his density and his hard-heartedness, it resonates with us some, somewhat, doesn't it? So, first of all, when, we, when God forgives our enemies, it exposes the condition of our hearts. So God had said, go to Nineveh, tell them my judgment is coming. And, and when, they, when Jonah finally did that, they repented. They repented, God relented, right? And we see a little picture of the gospel right in there. That God is always ready to receive back people into his family. He's always ready to forgive us because of what Christ has done for us. We, we can always return to him. You know, no matter how far we journey and try to run away from God, we discover that if we just take one, if we just turn one step back, he's right there, ready to forgive us and reconcile us and restore us to himself. So these Ninevites, they were experiencing a little glimpse of the same gospel that is preached to us. And Jonah is ticked that they repented, right? Did you see that in verse one? He is exceedingly displeased. That's a very polite way of saying he is so mad. He is fuming. He's got steam coming out of his ears, right? He is exceedingly displeased and angry. So angry, verse 3, that he wishes he was dead, right? That's a strange reaction for a prophet, isn't it? Right? We read, it, we read uh, the apostle um, Paul in the Philippians reading. His, his attitude was, I would love to go and be with the Lord, but it's, it would be better for you if I stay for a little while longer. What diametrically opposed uh, responses to God's grace in people's life. Jonah is so mad. Why is he so mad? I think because two things. One, his reaction is revealing the idolatry of his heart. Basically, if you have something in your life that if it's taken away, it makes you respond with, I, would, I wish I was dead. I'm so angry, I don't even want to go on living. Now, I'm not talking about like the loss of a loved one where you go, I don't know if I can go on living. That's different. I'm talking about the refusal to go on living, right? Like saying to God, you're not enough. I needed this thing and you've taken it away and now I just wish I was dead. So what is that for Jonah? Well, it's probably a little bit of self-righteousness, right? These Assyrians are wicked people and he's an Israelite, you know? These, these Assyrians are known for being, you know, coming into a city, plundering it, laying waste to it, carrying its people off into slavery. And, and he it feels justified in saying, God, why would you forgive people like that? They, they are terrible people, Jonah would say. It might be the national security question, right? They are a threat to Israel. God, I thought Israel was your people. Why are you going to bless people who are our enemies, who, who might come and attack us? Or maybe there's even some ethnocentrism in there. Maybe, you know, some Jonah saying, like, I'm an Israelite. I'm a child of Abraham. And those people are Gentiles. They're pagans. God, how could you pour out your grace on them? Do you see what I mean? That it's exposing some attitude, some belief that he has deep down. That is, it's the thing that makes his world make sense, right? What, what makes sense in his world is Assyria bad, Israel good. 
And God has now cut across that, and he's doing something different and new. And because Jonah has made that such the center of his world, it's like an idol, right? And anytime you poke someone's idol, they get mad, right? If you point out to someone that, that they have an idol of pride, or they have an idol of control, or they have, whatever it might be, when that comes out, it usually comes out with, with real anger. So what is it that makes your world make sense? You know, I know we all know, like, the Bible school answer, right? Like, Jesus, okay. Yeah, but, like, really? Like, on a, on a, on a random Tuesday at 3.30 in the afternoon, what is making your world make sense? Is it your superiority over someone else? Is it that you know you're the goody and they're the baddie, right? What would be the thing that would, could happen in the world that would make you go, I would rather be dead than see this happen, Right? You know, maybe, it's, maybe it would be seeing Joe Biden repent. Maybe it would be seeing uh, Donald Trump repent and God to, to pour out his blessing. Maybe it would be seeing your deadbeat ex become a Christian and suddenly start to live a life that you had always longed that they would live, right? Maybe it's seeing your controlling parents turn to Christ and seek reconciliation with you and their children. What is it that makes your world make sense, right? What is it that it deep down you know more than you know anything, right? That person is bad, and subtext, therefore I'm good. That's what I think is happening with Jonah. That's why he's so mad. That's why he's like steam coming out of his ears, you know, uh, like Looney Tunes, his eyes have become red, right? He's so furious. We need to do that work in our own heart. Is there someone that we look out into the world and we think, oh man, if God blessed that person... That would re- I would really struggle with that. Because there's, there's some idolatry there. Maybe it's self-righteousness. Maybe it's, maybe it's the national security. Maybe, maybe it's the ethnocentrism. But at the bottom of it, there's an idol somewhere. So I think this reaction exposes that. And I also think this reaction exposes just the depth of human sin, of, of Jonah's own sin. I, I mentioned he's, he's depicted as like, a, like an ironic comic, almost like a fool. You know, because his, his reaction is so, so out of bounds for what he himself has experienced just in the, in the last couple of chapters from Jonah. You know, he says in verse 2, this is, the whole, this is why I ran away, God, because I knew if I went there, you were going to forgive those people. And I didn't want to see that. So I was, I was running as far away as I possibly could. I knew that you are a God who is gracious and merciful. That's what he says. What, what's ironic, what's comic about this is that's a quotation from Exodus chapter 34, verse 6. And if you remember that middle section of the book of Exodus after they've come out of the land of Egypt, in Exodus 32, does anyone know what happens in Exodus 32? The golden calf. The golden calf. So when, when did God reveal that he was a God, gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and pouring out blessing on a thousand generations? at the lowest point of Israel's history, when they had abandoned God and rejected God and made an idol out of the the very material things that God had blessed them with as they went out of Egypt, they took those things and turned them into an idol. And it's at that moment, in, in their rebellion, in their idolatry, that Moses goes before God and pleads with God, and God, it uses the exact same word, and God relented and showed that he was a God gracious and merciful, abounding in steadfast love. Do you see what I'm saying? He, uh, Jonah is, whatever he is, whatever, whether that's not the geopolitical, whether that's the ethnocentric, whether that's the self-righteousness, whatever it is, he's, he's showing himself to be a fool because he's forgetting that the very way that Israel got to this place was because of the grace and favor of God. It wasn't because Israel wasn't sinful. It wasn't because he wasn't sinful, Right? Back in chapter 2, he was a rebellious prophet. He ran away from God, and God rescued him. He didn't deserve to be rescued. He didn't deserve that fish to come and save him from death. So how could he be mad that God was saving sinners? Because he's a sinner. Do you see what I mean? It reveals just how ignorant he was of his own brokenness and sin. You know, I think we often fall into comparing ourselves with other people. And when we get to pick the person that we're being compared to, it's interesting how we always come out on top, right? We always pick somebody who we can easily defeat in a contest of righteousness and and moral uprightness, right? 
It's like, it's, it would, it, but it's silly though, because it'd be like if I brag to you because I live in Fleming Island and y'all live in Middleburg and I'm closer to the river, okay? Well, if you choose a random point in the geography of the world, I guess you can boast in that. But if now we turn the other way and we say, well, but who's closer to the Pacific? Well, it seems kind of silly to boast about being closer to the Pacific when the Pacific is 3,000 miles away, right? How much more than God, who is, as the prayer book says, holy, 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 right? How are we going to boast over someone else when the distance between us and God is so far? Yeah, maybe the distance between me and my neighbor feels far if we're only looking at each other, but in comparison to God, we are both utterly sinful and broken and in need of God's grace. And, and God is good enough that he, he does rescue people. He does forgive our enemies, and when he does that, it reveals to us those idols and just how broken and ignorant of our brokenness, our sin, that we can sometimes be. So it, cons- uh, it exposes the condition of our hearts. And when God forgives our enemies, so God forgives our enemies, it exposes the condition of our hearts, and it does something else. It shows us just how gracious, just how abundant God's grace really is. In the second half of the passage, God gives Jonah this object lesson, right? And starting in verse 5, uh, Jonah Interestingly, he goes outside the city and, and builds a little shack for himself and, and watches the city. He kind of, it seems like what he's hoping for is that God will change his mind a second time and actually still judge Nineveh. That's kind of what he's rooting for, right? He's still rooting for Nineveh to be destroyed for that great judgment to come. And so right there in the midst of Jonah's anger and rebellion and idolatry and uh, sin, right there in that moment, God makes a little plant sprout up, you know, commentator's talk, probably a gourd of some kind. I don't know anything about plants, so whatever that means to you, but something that would give him shade, right? Grew up in a night, uh, or in a day, and gave him shade as he's sitting there stewing in his own rebellion and anger and idolatry at God. And Jonah, it says, was, remember before, he was exceedingly displeased, and now it says he was exceedingly glad. He was so thankful for this plant. But then in verse 7, Verse 8, God decides to take the plant away. He sends a little worm. The worm eats the plant. The plant withers. And then it says that the the sun was was like scorching heat. The east wind came on Jonah. And he was, you know, it was like uh, July in Florida. You know, he was, oh, heat stroke. Overwhelmed with this heat. And then it said he got angry again. So angry. Doubly angry. Right? God, he said, God says to him, are you right to be angry? And he says, yeah, I'm right to be angry, right? You, because of the plant. I'm, you know, I'm in the right, God. Now he even thinks he's more righteous than God, right? He's wishing again to die, verse 9. What's the point of this plant and the worm and this conversation with God? I think two things. One is Jonah, it seems like, has forgotten that God's grace is always a gift. It's always a gift. You cannot deserve it. If, it's, if you deserve it, it's not a gift, right? Paul says in Romans chapter 4 that to the one who works, uh, his, his money is given as wages, right? But to the one who believes, it is counted to him as righteousness. If we want to be reconciled to God, we want to receive God's grace, there is no, there is no boasting in ourselves. There is no I earned this. There is no I deserve this in, in the faith, right? It says, if you look at these verses, there's two things that actually connect that little plant with the mighty acts of God in this book that we've already seen. The first thing is it uses that same word that God appointed a plant to grow up and and give shade to Jonah. That's that same word appointed that came in the end of chapter one, that God appointed the fish to come and rescue Jonah. And so the author, maybe it's Jonah, in retrospect, you know, writing about his foolishness, or maybe it's somebody else writing. But the, the author wants us to connect the, the graciousness of God in giving the plant and the graciousness of God in rescuing Jonah from certain death as he was thrown overboard in the midst of the storm. There was an undeserved rescue from certain death, and it was because God appointed it. And the, the plant, too, was a gift. It was from God. There was nothing Jonah did to deserve the fish. In fact, he did everything to not deserve the fish, right? He deserved to sink to the bottom of the Mediterranean, not to be rescued. 
And he didn't deserve the plant, but God gave it to him anyway. And likewise, the the author wants us to connect this word discomfort. The plant, um, it's actually ESV translated, the plant saved Jonah from his discomfort, right? Saved him from the heat and the discomfort. But that word discomfort is actually the same word that's used just a little bit earlier, back in verse 10, that God relented of the disaster over Nineveh. And so in both of those ways, both in the deliverance of that undeserved fish that rescued Jonah and the deliverance of that repentant city, Nineveh, the author wants us to connect this plant with those two mighty acts of God. The point is, Jonah didn't deserve the plant. He didn't deserve the fish. And yes, those Assyrians did not deserve his forgiveness, and that's the whole point. Because grace that is deserved is no longer grace. So don't let any sense of deserving, as you live your life in faith before God, you confess your sins, and you're assured of God's forgiveness, and you come to his table, and you hear from his word, and all the ways that he's working in your life, never let a sense of deserving creep into your heart. Because if you do, and you allow it to live there too long, you'll start to be a fool like Jonah. Grace, and, and, and don't be afraid. Sometimes I think we're afraid of, we don't, we don't like to, after we become a Christian, to keep on talking about our sinfulness, to keep on talking about our brokenness. You know, We maybe don't like to pray the prayer of humble access. right? We're not so much worthy as to gather up the crumbs under your table, but you are the same God whose property is always to have mercy. It's always undeserved. And, and the more we realize just how undeserving we are of God's grace, actually the more we will love God. That's what Jesus said, right? The one who has been forgiven much loves much. So God's grace is a gift. It cannot be deserved. That's the first thing the plant teaches Jonah, hopefully. <laughs> That's what it teaches us. And the second thing is that God's grace is not small. It is not self-serving, but it is abundant. I'm using that word abundant. That, that's the word in Psalm 145, verse 7, that God is, has abundant goodness, overflowing goodness, overflowing grace. You know, Jonah loved when that plant came. Jonah loved when that fish came. Jonah loved when God's grace was aimed at him, right? The problem he had is when other people got to receive that same undeserved blessing. He he cared for the plant because it benefited him. But he didn't care anything at all about those people in Nineveh. Jonah's vision of God's grace was small, and it was about him. But God says, I have pity and compassion on this great city, for there are 120,000, and they don't even know their right from their left. They, yeah, of course they're sinners, because they don't know which way's up. Shouldn't I be compassionate toward them, God says? They don't even know right from wrong. So when we think about God's grace and, and give God thanks that his grace has come to us, do we love this great city that is around us? Do we recognize that there are dozens and scores and thousands of people who don't know their right from their left? Or do we harbor our resentment and our bitterness and, and, and keep, gra- keep the grace just for us because we're the ones who deserve it. Through the cross, there is abundant mercy and grace. We can be forgiven. We, we come week by week and confess our sins to God. And in the authority of Jesus, the priest stands and says, whoever comes with sincere repentance and true faith is forgiven. And God's word says so. God says, uh, come unto me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. There is abundant mercy. It never runs out, right? You can take all you can take, and it's not, there's not going to be any less, and your enemy can take all they can take, and there won't be any less. We, uh, perfect song this morning. His mercy is more, right? That, uh, what's the line? Um, uh, that the, uh, the ocean, thrown into a sea without bottom or shore. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. And that's actually, I was actually going to end with this analogy from Charles Spurgeon. He talks about God's grace like this. He says, uh, a child may go to the sea and take a little cup and fill it up from the ocean. And he says, your sin is like that cup. You can go and fill it up from the ocean and the ocean does not miss that little cup of salt water. He says, uh, the ocean of love will never miss all that you can take from it. So come, take, 
all that you can take. That's the view of God's grace that we're supposed to get from the book of Jonah, from scripture as a whole. That this immense, abundant grace that, that gives us that safe place to admit that there's sin and idolatry in our own hearts, that strengthens us then to turn out to the world and be the prophet like Jonah should have been when he heard the call of God and ran as fast as he could to tell the city of Nineveh that God is warning of judgment, but that there is abundant grace if you will turn to him. So as we go the rest of our service this morning, as we come to confess our sins, as we hear the absolution, as we come to the Lord's table, remember, take all that you can take, and, and that ocean of grace will not miss it. Amen. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, oh, to be a man who lives this out in my own life, who lets the immensity and abundance, this bottomless, boundaryless grace, root out all the sin and idolatry that I harbor in my heart, to root out all the bitterness and resentment, all the self-righteousness, all the sense that I am better than another, Lord. Oh, to be that man. And Lord, oh, to be that church in your community here in Middleburg and Fleming Island and Jacksonville, Lord. Would you give us that big of a vision of you and thereby set us free from all the brokenness that we harbor in our hearts. And Lord, we do pray for revival in our time. We pray for the good news to go forth and bear fruit, Lord. And so would you strengthen us to be part of that mission. We pray for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.